Hey everybody, before I get started, I just wanted to mention a couple of ways that you can engage with me on a more personal level. I have a few avenues set up and I keep focusing on one and I figured, why don't I make a short little video talking about all of them real quick before we get into these uh, episodes. So first thing, Patreon. There's a link in the episode description and every episode description to the Patreon, as well as uh, a video on the feed called Major Announcement that has all the details of what each tier offers and how much they cost. I implore you to check that out. I offer a lot of cool shit for my patrons. Uh, second thing, the Discord channel. There's also a Discord link in the episode description and in every episode description. I have multiple channels set up there for each show that I'm covering, and it's a great way to just engage with me. I have a channel set up for... Uh, uh, MMA talk as well. I'm a big MMA fan. So if you're an MMA fan, you can check that out as well. There's a link to the discord in the episode description. And then lastly, oh, the Facebook and Twitter, social media, follow me on there. I post news on there. When I say news, I mean like, hey, I'm stopping covering this show. Hey, I'm starting covering this show. Let me know what you think about this. I do uh, live watches of things on Facebook where like I'll check in and say, I'm watching so-and-so show. And then I'll like live comment while I'm watching it. And that'll be cool if maybe you watch that show too and you want to watch along with me or you're watching it later and you want to see my thoughts, which are usually pretty entertaining because I'm usually pretty high when I'm writing them. So uh, check out all those links in each episode description and let's talk about this episode. Peace. One mic, one mic. Yeah. All I need is one mic. One mic. Yeah. All I need is one mic. Hey everybody, welcome back to One Mic, where I watch shit so you don't have to. And today I'm here to talk about Season 1, Episode 8, the season finale of FX and Hulu's Kindred, entitled Alice. Uh, this episode title refers to Alice, the character within the show, because we learned that it is Alice, in fact, and not Carrie, who Rufus is supposed to be with. At least that's what we are led to believe. Uh, Dana discovers this when she drops the names of Tom and Rufus to Denise. And Denise is like, you know what? We got a family Bible that has our whole lineage in it that you don't know about, but just so happens to be in your house. How convenient. <laughs> and uh, yeah, she opens up the book and she sees that uh, Rufus and Alice are seen together. I'm gonna go ahead and kind of sort of eat crow on my prediction of Rufus and Dana being together. I, I Only because I can't figure out, given the book, how they still end up together. If the book didn't, if the book wasn't a thing, I probably would still find a way to say it's gonna be Dana, but I don't, my gut still feels like that's a possibility. But the book seems pretty clear that it's meant to be Alice, so I will eat crow in that regard, but I will not in the, in the regard that I was right that it wasn't Carrie, and I was also right that that means that Celeste and that baby died because Dana had a dumb fucking hunch. So <laughs> I'm still right about that. But uh, I'll, I'll leave that alone. Not a big deal. And like I said, I still kind of feel like Dana. Dana's on the table. But I, I feel like if she had looked at that book, she would have seen her own name there. So do you think it's a... Hmm. Do you think it's a possibility that given what I said about Dana's going to come back at some point, Rufus is going to be significantly older and she's going to have a thing for him or they're going to get together or maybe Rufus a raper. I, I don't know, but that was my, my prediction. Do you think it's possible that given the fact that Dana now knows, given what's in the book, that Ruf is supposed to be Rufus and Alice, do you think that if Dana does end up pregnant by Rufus, that she knows the book is supposed to say Alice, so she puts Alice in there, or someone puts Alice in there to hide the fact that it's Dana. If that ends up happening, I like I feel like I need to like play the lottery or some shit. Cause that's not that's from I don't feel like that's from left field. It's kind of from left field, but that's just me not wanting to eat crow about this. But I do still think that it's not gonna be that simple. Let's see. So where I want to go. Uh well, uh, well, for starters, I can talk about the season as a whole. Uh, since it's over, I got to say, you know, I think they did a solid job with this finale, uh, wrapping up this season, setting up season two, which I'll, I'll talk about that at the end of the video. Um, yeah, unfortunately, there's so much wrong with this show, at least this first season. I'm only like marginally interested in season two. And it's mostly because of I see a lot of potential potentially interesting plot lines that can come out of the the events of this episode. But 
I can't, I, I don't mean, I don't know if I could, t like, I don't know if I'm even willing to willingly enter into another season of a character who behaves stupidly every episode. Like, that really irks me, having to see a character be stupid to to further the plot. And I, 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 I don't see any reason why that aspect of this show would change in season two. And I can't see myself willingly entering into that. I might as like a kind of like a little spare time, like, oh, let me check this out. I can guarantee you I won't be covering the season two on my channel, but well, I can't guarantee that. If things go well enough, anybody, any any show can get it if, if things go well enough. But moving on, we open this episode with a flashback to 1989 Brooklyn. Uh, we see young Olivia talking with her mother-in-law about pregnancy. The mother-in-law says that that baby could save her life. And that line, I think, really only serves to be a tease for whatever's going to happen with them next season because well I'll, I'll i'll get to i'll get to the baby saving her life i think i might not remember to directly reference that line but remember that i'm referring to that line when i get to something that sounds like it's related to that line i feel like i'm not gonna remember <laughs> um so yeah we 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 learn about that in 1989 brooklyn i think that's something to carry with us going into next season uh what this mother-in-law said about uh, Olivia's child, that being Dana, obviously. Uh, so moving on, <laughs> I don't know how 1815 is present day, but <laughs> we return to present day and uh, Sarah's reiterating to Dana how fucked she is uh, and that she now belongs to Tom and she encourages, she being Sarah, encourages Dana to leave that night. Uh, she does start to leave and Nigel sees her leaving and essentially puts her in a position where she has to admit that Luke ain't coming back. Uh, Nigel wants to go with her. She's like, we ain't gonna talk about it here. We're gonna go talk about it somewhere safe. And I believe they go to like, Win I think Winnie's cabin was where Sarah said that, uh, uh, what's her name? Dana, <laughs> where Dana likes to hang out. <laughs> like you said, where she likes to hang out when she's trying to avoid doing her chores. <laughs> I'm like, Dana's such a fucking child, bro. <laughs> um, so Kevin has allowed Winnie to leave. Cause I mean, what's he gonna do? Uh, so he returns to Olivia's crib. He grabs the man clothes that were uh, earmarked for Winnie. And Alice guards the door with a gun, essentially saying, no one in, no one out until Olivia gets back. Very mature of uh, Alice. But of course, I feel like how could you have an immature kid in these times where you have to be grown as soon as you come out of the fucking womb? So, of course she's grown. Uh, Olivia arrives at the plantation. And Sarah, <laughs> Sarah continues to be my spirit animal. By telling Olivia, like, every time every time Dana come around, she fucking shit up. Just like your stupid ass, when you came up, you was fucking things up, too. Y'all could be kin. <laughs> like, yo, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, but this does lead into her pointing out that, uh, this was actually a pretty big reveal, that Sarah's the one who's been killing, who had been killing Margaret's kids. And it was Sarah who turned Rufus over uh, on his stomach to try to kill her. And, I mean, him... And that would have been everything. She thought that if that had been able to happen, uh, Margaret would have been gone and she would have had a perfectly fine time with just Tom and everyone else there. And then Olivia came and fucked that all up. So uh, that was a pretty big reveal. Not surprising, but interesting. Um, so Nigel and Dana are speaking in private in the, I'm, again, I'm assuming this is Winnie's cabin. Uh, Tom bursts in and he chastises Dana because he sees a book on the table and he's like, oh, how dare you come up in here reading? I told you not to goddamn read. Are you over here motherfucking reading? And then Dana, proving yet again that she ain't never read a motherfucking book, says, Tom, I will teach you how to read. And I'll put in my notes, he, he about to whoop her ass. Sure enough, <laughs> Tom proceeds to do exactly that. And I, I, I'm laughing, not at, obviously not at Dana getting her ass whooped, but I'm laughing at the fact that Again, like I said, I as she's saying the words, I'm like, this motherfucker's stupid as hell. <laughs> like, why would you say that? Uh, so, you know, I talked in the last video about the rape scene at the uh, uh, referring to Jane and how it didn't feel like brutal for the sake of brutal. They don't even show it. This whipping scene with Tom and Dana is quite brutal, and they do show it, but. Its brutality is largely carried by Mallory Johnson. She's who plays, she's the woman who plays Dana. Mallory Johnson's performance in this scene. Because, man, oh man, does she fucking crush this scene. 
she sells that scene like she asked Ryan to actually whip her. Because I'm like, I need to be screaming for real <laughs> for this to work. That was a powerful scene. Like, her screams, like, like I mean, you can watch that and not think, like, is she getting whipped for real? Like, that is a performance, if you think that. And I, I, obviously, she wasn't getting whipped for real. But it was like, her performance was strong enough that you could be like, damn, it seemed like she getting whipped for real. That was a great Great performance by her in that scene. Really good. Uh, and then Olivia jumps on her uh, as she arrives. And right before Tom is about to strike another blow, they disappear back to 2016 right before his eyes. So um, I am going to move to... No, I'm going to continue with Dana. And then we'll move to well, something else later. Uh, so Dana's back at her house where she... The same spot that she returns to every time. And we are back at the beginning of episode one, where everything was happening that we didn't know what it meant. Um, oh, and of note, Olivia is nowhere to be found. Also of note, <laughs> I think I figured out, not figured out, because I, I, uh, this was not a, a, an incredible deduction on my part, but I, I called into question uh, the, the logistics of what can go back and forth through time, and Olivia saying, that's just a hunk of metal, which I do still think that is... is poor in the writing just because that character should be looking at that as like the ring went back and I mean Kevin went back and forth the ring went back and forth why would I not believe that I can go back and forth but what I think is happening is that if the person or item originates from 1815 it can't go back that's why their clothes disappear when they come back but Kevin can come back because he's not from 1815 Olivia can come back because she's not from 1815 so like I think that's what it is, but the show has done nothing to uh, uh, to really explain that to us or make that clear, at least. Uh, let's see. So, picking up kind of like where episode one started, we see some of those scenes again, and there's a little bit more clarity to some of them, and I'm going to talk about that uh, right now. Uh, we see Dana charging Kevin's phone. Uh, I think in episode one, I think we all naturally assumed that she was charging her own phone, but it turns out that it's Kevin's phone. Kevin's phone, which she, I don't know how she had it on her. He must have left it. I mean, he w probably would have left it on the plantation. She must have snagged it. She tucks it in like the back of her panties, which side note, when she tucks it in the back of her panties and Tom takes her to what ends up being the whipping scene, I thought it was going to be a rape scene because he tears her uh, her shirt, the back of her shirt open, I'm thinking he's gonna pull her pants down and, and find the phone, and I'm like, oh, what's gonna happen here? But that doesn't end up happening. So she charges, uh, she charges Kevin's phone, and Kevin's sister, Penny, immediately picks up on this and starts to track it once it's back on. And the second thing that we learned, too, is that the police who arrived at Dana's house in episode one were called by Penny, and not by the nosy-ass neighbors, Hermione, and I think uh, Carlo uh, is the husband's name. So... I want to talk about the clusterfuck that ended up happening in Dana's house in the back half of this episode. And when I say clusterfuck, I don't mean it in an insulting way. I just mean, like, it was literally a clusterfuck. There was all these different entities within Dana's, like, foyer. <laughs> and there was a whole lot of shit going on. But I do want to talk about that scene. And I don't like implausible shit. If you've been paying attention to any of the previous seven videos, you know that. And I felt like everything that happened from the on the police side of things was pretty implausible. Like Dana had no reason to let them in. They certainly had no right to start making themselves comfortable walking around, asking questions. Did you just move in? Like making it sound like she was under investigation. You're supposed to be here doing a, like a, well, I mean, I guess they were there to look for Kevin, but like you should be like, quite like questioning. Like I, if I was them, I would just stay in the doorway area and ask whatever questions, but like, I, again, at the same time, I guess they are going to be free and, t and take whatever liberty liberties that Dana gives them, but like, I don't know, I just felt it implausible that Dana would even let them in, let alone walk around like that, let alone ask those intrusive fucking questions that they were asking, but again, this show does a poor job of, of the means, and what I mean by the means is like, this show fo focuses on the end, you heard the phrase, the, the, the end justify the means? This show focuses on the ends. And the end here was the goal of that clusterfuck. Everyone being in that room, knowing that Dana's back was fucked up, and having the conversations that they had. And the show said, that's where we need to be. 
how do we get there? And I talked about that with the writing on Andor, and it was related to this show. It was one of these videos, but I talked about that, like the, the how do we get there kind of deal. And I just felt like everything that they did to put us there felt implausible. And that's that's what I think that's where I think we do things wrong. I feel like there there's probably, and I'm not a writer, so I'm not gonna sit here and say that I know better, but I feel like there's a lot more plausible way, plausible of a way to get those parties into that living room without making my eyes roll. Like, okay, come on. Like, the police shouldn't have been inside. Penny shouldn't have been inside. Like, how'd she just walk in? Like, who the fuck are you? Get the fuck out of here. Like, <laughs> and then, the, still in this scene, something that bothered me, Dana doesn't even have the common decency to tell Penny, who is worried sick about Kevin and where he is, I'm not about to say she doesn't tell Kevin where she is. She doesn't even have the common decency to uh, tell Penny that Kevin's not the one who fucked her back up. And after Penny leaves, she starts crying and she tells Denise, like, I, I, I would have told her the truth, but she wouldn't have believed me. Yeah, she wouldn't have believed where Kevin is, but you could have at least told her that he ain't do that. Like, <laughs> like... It's been, like, four straight, five straight videos of me pointing out implausible or stupid things that happen in this show. I'm not really going to harp on that, but, like, uh, come on, man. Like, and what does it serve the plot to have Penny not know that? Like, I'm thinking, like, okay, let's say Penny's a real person. Penny's at home, or, well, we know she's not at home. She's gossiping with <laughs> Carlo or Hermione now, but she's thinking in her mind, where is my brother? What has happened to him? She knows something. She's not telling me. Did he do that to her? Is he? Has he been drinking? Again? Like all of these things. She could have at least alleviated the fear of did my brother get fucked up and beat the shit out of her to the point where her back is black. I mean, bleeding. Her back was already black. Her back, her back is bleeding. But she doesn't even say that. She could have at least said he ain't do this to me. Like you don't have to know where he is to know that Kevin didn't do that. So she could say, you know, she got who did? It wasn't Kevin. Don't worry about it. Like, so, I don't know. That just that just kind of bothered me. But I do like how this scene, where she says, like, uh, I would have told her, but she wouldn't have believed me, how it feeds into the scene where she's crying about uh, having left Kevin there. And I'm not going to... Uh, here's one where I can pat myself on the back, because I've been saying Kevin was going to get left there since, like, episode two. <laughs> so, uh, pat myself on the back there. But, you know, she crushes this scene, too. Like, the crying about how it's all her fault, which it is, uh, the crying about how it's all her fault, screaming. My favorite part of this whole thing was after she's cr she's crying. She's going, it's all my, my fault. I left him. I said I wouldn't. What's he going to do? I promised him. And Denise goes, it's going to be okay. And she goes, it's not going to be okay, Denise. Like, I love the fact that that called out a lot of like, it felt like it was a call out of a history of like shitty responses in that situation. Like, that's a shitty thing. It's going to be okay. Like, it's not like you could tell from what she's saying if you even kind of believe her how serious this is. And I like how I like the fact that Dana kind of snapped her back into reality and out of these canned responses that not only don't help, they only worsen things. And it, it the fact the way Dana responded is proof that those torp, that the, those types of responses worsen things. So I like the I love that scene because I love Mallory's performance in it, but I also love the fact that she didn't let Dana just, I mean, Denise go, it's, it'll be okay. Like that, if, if she hadn't have snapped back, that would have ended up being in my, this is a stupid fucking line to utter in this episode, uh, uh, lists of criticisms. So I like the fact that Dana called that out. I thought that was another really, really, really strong scene and a great scene for uh, Mallory Johnson. Um, another great scene that follows, uh, Tom bursts into the cabin that Kevin is at and he asks where Dana is. Once Tom... Once Tom asked Kevin, it's too many fucking names, man. Like, I keep having, like, get the names together in my mind for some reason. Once Tom asked, yes, once Tom asked Kevin how Dana disappeared, Kevin puts together a lot of uncomfortable truths in that moment. Not just that Dana left, not just that he's stuck, but the fact that he could be stuck there for years without an opportunity to go, maybe for the rest of his life. Can you imagine being in that scenario? I mean, already the scenario of going back to slavery times is wild. But can you imagine finding out that way 
and all of that in that in that moment that you might never go back to 2016. You might just be stuck in, in on a plantation. Being a white man, that's probably not that bad for him, but that's that's what he was left to contend with, and that fucking sucked, man. Uh, we later see Kevin years later at the end of the episode with an older Alice. Uh, I don't know if he's shopping for slaves or if he's looking for Dana, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit when I talk about what I what I'm looking forward to in season two or what I'm expecting from season two. And then lastly, Alan tells Denise that they found Olivia. So I'm going to feed this rather than talking on those last two things. I'm going to kind of like feed that into my season two uh, kind of like questions. And uh, uh, that'll kind of speak to those those last couple of items. So I'm intrigued by not just how Dana and Kevin's reunion will be, but how much, if in any way, being in these slavery times alone as a white man will change Kevin or if it changes him at all. Um, and has he been obsessed with finding Dana? Like, was he, like I said, was he looking for Dana or is he actually, has he changed? Has he kind of like taken into his role in a, in a role of power in this time? Has he taken to that to the point where like now he's just like, yeah, you know, I own slaves now. It, it is what it is. Like, is he that, is he like that? And to, you know, I kind of hope he is because I just think that'll make when Dana returns 10 times more interesting because he's going to be coming back thinking like he's going to be older. She's probably not going to be coming back thinking he's now a slave owner. <laughs> like, so that could make for all sorts of interesting possibilities in their relationship. And I'm really, uh, really interested in, in seeing how that plays out. Like, I know I'm at least watch episode one, <laughs> season two. If it gets a season two, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't, if I'm being honest. But uh, they don't specify whether or not Olivia was found alive. And I think that raises some interesting questions because did she return into the car that she left from and then she drowned and they found her body in, in whatever body of water uh, she crashed into? Is she alive and is now in or was found in the equivalence of uh, the equivalent of the spot in the house that Dana always returns to like does she have a spot that she always returns to and and did she return there uh yeah and I think it makes that I I, I did remember I think it makes that this baby could save your lifeline loom a little bit large over season two I feel like because we haven't seen Dana save Olivia's life at any moment yet, right? As a matter of fact, we've seen Olivia save Dana's life. We haven't seen Dana save Olivia's life at any point. And if Olivia's dead, then that option is off the table. So I feel like Olivia's alive. They found her alive. And Dana's going to have to do something to save her. So um, that's all I have for this finale. That's all I have for this season. Let me know what you thought about this season and this episode in the comments. I can promise you I will not be covering season two, but I might watch it. We'll see. Uh, let me know what you thought of this show. Uh, I've been pretty clear with what I thought. Uh, I will see you guys next time. And until then, peace.